and welcome to the Popcorn Junkies. This is our review or a review of American fiction. Now, this is a film that when the trailer came out, the, uh, you know, there, there wasn't much interest in the UK, interestingly, around this film. And I, presume, I can only presume that's because Jeffrey Wright isn't a sort of massive, bankable, you know, household name of a star. Also, I think the title, American Fiction, I think sometimes there are certain projects that are released where I think a number of, the, of British cinema goers assume that this is targeted or specifically for an American audience. They're, they're sort of curious films. Anyway. American Fiction. It's the new film starring, as I say, Jeffrey Wright. Jeffrey Wright, if you don't know him, he was in things like Westworld. Um, he's become a sort of regular in Wes Anderson films with cameos. Um, he was in a fantastic film. I forget the name of it. What was it bloody called? In which he, he acted. Uh, it was a fiction, but he acted within a real penitentiary with real life inmates. Uh, fabulous, fabulous film. Me and Maddie saw it at the Tribeca Film Festival. Um, his first kind of moment that he kind of hit the kind of network of kind of Hollywood, if you like, was uh, when he played uh, Basquiat, the pop artist. He plays a professor and a writer in this. He's uh, Thelonious Monk, I think. Yeah, as in he's not the pianist, jazz pianist, but that's his name, Thel Thelonious Monk Ellison. Um, he plays a writer uh, in a film that is essentially a film about, what is it about? It's about the fictions created, or the American fiction, but it's not just American, British fiction, the fictions that we create for black people and for black culture and for the black experience. Um, we all, as white, middle class and not middle class, you know, sort of white, awokened, awakened um, people, uh, believe that we are kind of all, you know, we're, we, we're, 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 we've got to grips with what this whole kind of, you know, the white privilege is, we've got to grips with stereotypes that are wrong, archetypes that are wrong. Um, we're across the need for diversity and we're across the need for representation. Important distinctions between the two, though. Diversity is one thing, a genuine mix, a visual mix, if you like. Uh, representation, are you representing the values, the, the culture, the society, the thoughts, the feelings, the emotions, the concerns of the culture from which you come? different matter altogether. Lots of Oscar chatter about this. Jeffrey Wright's been nominated. Um, Sterling K. Brown's been nominated. Also in there is Isa Ray. She's brilliant. Um, and also Tracy Ellis Ross. So what's the premise? The premise here is he's a professor. Um, he's a writer. His books don't sell. Um, he, uh, <laughs> the film starts, and in, in essence, you know when you do, the, the used to do the kind of charades, and sometimes rather than kind of doing the words, you go, whole thing. Um, well, the whole thing is kind of beautifully summarised with the opening scene. As a professor, he's talking about the use of the N-word, and what's really funny about this scene, and it, it's a great way to start the film, because it sets you up for what really the whole film's exploration is. A young white woman, uh, you know, very white woman, young white student, takes offence at using the word, the N-word. Um, and, and he gets slowly and gently and gradually aggrieved and aggravated by this and makes the point, if I'm all right with it, because I'm black, you can be all right with it. But I think what's interesting about that scene is that that kind of speaks to, I think, much of the problem around the way in which white people engage with the black experience, Black Lives Matter, the normalization of, of being black and the integration of black culture. And, and I think there are real challenges, and this film really homes in on them, where on the one hand, we all like the diversity of different cultures. We like that, not because it's different in a stereotypical way, but because it's different. There are huge things to be cherished about difference, but it's when that difference then becomes a source of prejudice. So anyway, in that opening moment, you've got this idea of, oh, hang on. So what, white people are more offended by the N-word than black people, possibly? can see it, I know what they mean. So he's a writer, he hasn't sold a book. They're too good, maybe. They're too erudite. They're too, they're not black enough. His books aren't black enough, that's the idea. Uh, and then he get, he's, he's put on a sabbatical because basically his bosses don't like the way in which he's kind of being aggravating with his students and pushing back on their sort of white wokery, if you like. Whilst on this sabbatical, he goes to a sort of book conference where he's, he's going to do a promotion for his book. No one's interested in his book. And then, he, and then he stumbles across this kind of, this room, this conference, it's in the trailer where you see Isa Rae is kind of, you know, talking about a new book and her new book is called Wheeze Lives in the Black Ghetto. And then, you know, and then when she's asked to read from it, she goes into sort of, well, what would you call it? A sort of black vernacular, a kind of street vernacular, a stereotypical style of writing that for Jeffrey Wright in this film and for many other black people, he feels, ah, oh, so you can have success and you can make it as a writer if you deliver what these white wokery people think is your experience, think should be your only experience. And it's expressed about things that white people can only get on board with if they're the things that white people think is your experience. It's like, it must be fuck. I, I'm, I'm saying this as a white person, it must be beyond fucking annoying to constantly be talked or have a conversation with someone if you're black. And the first conversation is always about being black. 
because I don't have a first conversation about being white when I have a conversation with people. So you, you, you get me? So it's, it's, it's that whole kind of thing. So the idea that he's not black enough hits us hard. His career, you know, what's great about this film is it indelibly and indirectly, a little bit like that film Waves, which interestingly, I think Sterling K. Brown played the father in that. You know, it's incidental that the class status of Jeffrey Wright's family and this black family and his black family in this film, the class status is relatively high. They have beach houses. I don't know if it is. It's near Boston. You know, they, they live in shuttlebord. You know, they're wealthy. They're, they're, they're well off. They're, they're, they're a kind of company, you know, and, and that, and I think that again, just that alone speaks to how even as a white kind of rehabilitated, as in all white people could be more rehabilitated kind of uh, person who, who looks at and, and tries to kind of accept that they've had white privilege and tries to always analyse it more and more and, so on and accept it from different angles. You know, once again, just to have a story told, which is incidentally about a black family that's well off, you know, they, they, they're all doing professional jobs. And the reason I'm saying that, which might sound strange, why am I homing in on that? It shouldn't be a thing we're homing in on. I think the mainstream still, certainly in this country, does not think of black people in America like that other than the Obamas. It's a, it's, a, it's a terrible fact. So he's grumpy, he's dissatisfied, he's creatively dissatisfied. It's a nice film, this is a nice film, not just about the expectations and the curated space that academics and the white liberal elite uh, say is permissible for black people, but it's also a neat, neat little kind of uh, film about the creative process. And at what point are you being honest to yourself? And at what point are you sacrificing yourself? And when do you say yes to doing something in a certain way? Because actually it's gonna give you money and bring you money and we'll get onto why he needs the money in a minute. Um, and so, you know, it's an interesting film about both, both, you know, black stereotypical demands of that black people, but also it's about creativity. And it's also um, a film about family. This film very much splits into two kind of, it's got, it's got two sort of thrusts to it, if you like, two threads, and they really very much run parallel to each other. There's the, there's the kind of, there's the wise cracking succession-like, and as I understand it, I think Cord Jefferson, the director, uh, was one of many of the script writers on, on, on a series, series like Succession, and you can feel that. There's a real whip-smart, clever observational humour very, 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 very much soaked and marinated in deep, dark irony. You know, the caricatures, or not even the caricatures, the characterization of the publishers, the PR teams, the, the movie producers that want to make us, you know, and all this kind of stuff that kick in. It, they're, they're brilliantly drawn. And Jeffrey Wright, and Jeffrey Wright's agent, who is brilliant, his agent is played by uh, John Ortiz. He's fantastic, this sort of hapless agent who also wants to make a buck. And, you know, look, we're going to get, get, yeah. Anyway, so what happens? He's seen his array reading from this book in this kind of street talk, and then he says, as a joke, I'm gonna write this piece of shit, a kind of caricature. I'm gonna do a satirical, I'm gonna write a piece of satirical nonsense, the kind of shit that white people would love and lap up and want and demand of us all the time. The kind of experiences and the diaspora of the black experience that they, can own, they can't get beyond, but they wanna hear about it. And in their liberal ivory towers, they wanna feel like they've rubbed shoulders with the authenticity of black poverty and the black experience. That's, yeah, right. So he writes it, it's funny, very neat little scene, kind of could have maybe done with a few others of these actually, where as he's writing this kind of stereotypical stuff, <laughs> two actors pop up and they're enacting his dialogue. And there's quite neat, funny moments in there where the actors actually look at him and go, why would I say that? So he, even he, even Jeffrey Wright's character, Thelonious Monk, is struggling to get to get on board with this kind of speak or this language. It doesn't come, doesn't come naturally to him. And I thought that was a really neat detail. It's not like, this wasn't one of those films where he went inside and found his Eddie Murphy from Trading Places type persona. He, he had a struggle to get there himself. And that in itself turns the whole kind of stereotypical thing on its head. In fact, there were moments where I felt he had some strange affinities, his character, with Nick Cage's character from Dream Scenario. You know, this sort of, not, he's not quite as middle-aged as Nick Cage and that, but, uh, but you know, a nondescript man of a nondescript age, having not done anything particularly descript, if there's such a word, uh, you know, a nondescript career at, at this point. You know, he's creative, he's loved, he's, he, you know, but he, but he hasn't made a mark. And so he's kind of invisible in, in, in his own way. And then, so, as I say, he writes this book, you get a satirical book, yeah. And alongside it, we meet his family. And I think, you know, these, are two, these two parts of the film, each of them offered something very meaningful, but so different. I, I often struggled with this film to weave the two together. There's an obvious reason as to why they weave together, because we meet his family, his father's passed away. It's not, also, it's not a kind of loving, happy family. It's kind of mum is acerbic and she's tart in her comments. She's sharp, she's harsh. Uh, you know, the dead dad was a philanderer, wasn't there, hurt his mum, was off having affairs all the time. Um, as I say, the mum is brisk. His relationship with his sister, which is lovely, Tracy Ellis Ross, she's great. She plays a, a surgeon. Again, all their jobs, middle class, middle class, middle class. It was lovely, you know, it's kind of bantery, it's sharp, it's kind of a bit guarded, it's that sibling kind of thing going on there. I liked all of that. But 
his uh, brother, his brother Sterling K. Brown, comes in and he's a, he's a sensational piece of acting, actually, Sterling K. Brown. He's not actually on screen for very long, but he, he leaves such a lasting impression. I mean, he's quite literally the black sheep of the family, if you like. And he, he clearly he takes too many drugs. He's involved in cosmetic surgery. He's kind of fast and loose at the edges. He was married, but his, his wife left him because he was, he was she caught him having sex with a man. He's gay, essentially. Uh, he's obviously had to be in the closet. His family won't have engaged with this. So at a certain point in the film, there's a really heartbreaking moment where his, as we discover, their mum is, is, is basically get, got Alzheimer's. So you've got this incredibly, incredibly damaged, but also the way Sterling K. Brown played it was so great. He was brisk. He was angular. He was holding at arm's length. He was angrily sexual. He was, you know, frustrated. He was clearly the, 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 the sibling or the child that had been stood at the edge and couldn't be his true self. And so you've got all this idea of what is your true self? Who are you? You haven't just, and this is a great film. It's a great film that indirectly and incidentally actually does who am I and what can I present to the world in terms of gay politics as much as it does about the black experience too, because actually Stanley K. Brown speaks to a lot, if you like, of what all of a strangers explores in an incredibly sort of poetic and, and mesmeric sort of a moving, moving way. Interestingly drawn characters, beautifully written, really nice interrelationships and all this kind of stuff. And it's from here that we discover that their mother is, is slowly, you know, being caught up in an outsymic diagnosis. And so they need money. They need money. But also a tragedy happens to the family. I won't ruin it because that's, that's uh, there's some spoilers here. But, you know, one of the family, something awful happens to one member of the family and you don't expect it. Um, that was neatly dealt with. It wasn't overly saccharine. It wasn't overly sentimental too. There, were, there was great comedy within some of the more emotional dark moments there too. Um, but, but essentially Jeffrey Wright finds himself in a position where he kind of needs money. He could do with this money to kind of help with paying for his mum. And so his agent says, you're not going to believe it. I've sent that satirical piece of shit that you wrote as a basically a fingers up to the entire publishing industry and they want it. They not only want it, they want it for three quarters of a million dollars and Jeffrey Wright's like, no, no, no. Anyway, so they go even further. They double down on the deceit and they go, right, no, you're gonna, we're going to go for this. We're going to publish it. He convinces Jeffrey Wright and then he says to him, your profile has to be that of an escaped convict. You've got to be an escaped, you, you, you've just come out of prison and you've done time. And, and so this great, long, elaborate fictional portrait in American fiction of who Jeffrey Wright is, what his background was, where he comes from, what his shtick is, has been created and constructed to sit alongside this book that these white ivory tire towered publishers who are like as soon as and they're on the phone and when they hear it's a wonderful moments in the trailer too where the publisher listens and hears uh, jeffrey wright's kind of well-spoken voice and then when she hears his street voice the street voice of the prison the hard knocks voice she's like yeah this is it i can get down with it and it really talks to the idea of how many white people and so much of white culture and white controlled culture and, and certainly the creative medias the media you know creative media like uh, you know film and television and writing and all this kind of stuff there is a kind of as stereotypically prejudicial uh, racist approach to what being a black writer should be, could be, or they want it to be. There are some, you know, it's interesting, again, it evolves into some of its own prejudices. Jeffrey Wright struggles with his own identity. There's a moment, a really clever moment, where the book gets published, it becomes a huge success. There's this deep irony that it's potentially going to be nominated for the Booker Prize, on which he's a judge, and there are two black judges. They've put the two black judges on the Booker Prize long uh, judging panel, so they've got diversity. And then you've got this curious situation where you've got white people uh, and <laughs> and his black colleague, is Isra Ray, the author of the book at the beginning of the film. They're all on this panel, and he's beginning to judge himself. He's like, at one point, the girl, the woman. Now, the woman that he starts a an affair with, or not an affair, but a relationship with across the way, across the road from where his parents live on this in this lovely coastal resort, um, her name, the actress, is Erica Alexander. She is sensational. She is wondrous. She's beautiful. She's sassy. She's smart. She doesn't take his bullshit. But when, weirdly, she loves the book that he's right, which incidentally, at a certain point in the film, he's changed the title of it to something which is going to throw... He wants to call it fuck. Everyone goes, you can't call it fuck. And then even that, everyone goes, oh no, we could turn that to our advantage. Great moment where the PR manager of the publicity of the book's like, uh, don't know if we can call it fuck. I think we could call it fuck. Let's call it fuck. Anyway, so Jeffrey Wright's girlfriend that he's, he makes in the film, she likes the book and he gets angry with her because she's signed up to or bought into or enjoys something in this essentially black pulp fiction, if you like. This kind of white designated permitted storytelling or self-expression that he feels is the only thing that culture or society or the, you know, the creative media industries wants to get on board with. And so you've got that neat, and that's neat. There's a sort of sl sl slight contradiction in there too, which is really nice. Parts of the film that didn't really work for me, there's the whole housekeeper, the housekeeper who's lovely, who looks after the house, Jeffrey Wright's family's house on, on the on the coast. That's sweet, there was a love interest. That was trying to work out what that was kind of trying to tell us. There was a kind of purity and, a, and an intimacy and a simplicity to, the, uh, to her and the fact that she falls in love with the police officer in the local kind of coastal town. And for, because the family's kind 
kind of falling apart because the mum's going, the sis something's happened to the sister, the dad died before the film, committed suicide, in fact. You know, there's a sort of, I, I found it a bit twee, I found all that a bit twee, I found that a bit driving Miss Daisy. I almost found, and I didn't know whether the film was trying to be meta about uh, the housekeepers falling in love, whether she, they were trying to almost send up slightly that driving Miss Daisy kind of thing. I don't know, it felt a bit too twee and a bit too saccharine. And so all of this kind of leads to Jeffrey Wright kind of not only being successful as a writer, but he also sells the rights and it becomes a film and it's a film for Netflix. And he has to change the ending of even this book to make it even more dramatic. And that's all quite witty. You have, you know, they break the fourth wall. You have a real story breaking into a fictionalized story and you don't know which is which. And then there's a neat ending where he's kind of the film ends with him kind of leaving the kind of. Uh, the uh, f uh, the film studio lot, where, and, and as he's leaving, he looks over and sees a young black man who's playing a slave, actually, in the drama uh, which is being made of his book. And so, you know, there are lots and lots and lots of clever little kind of meta-narrative kind of points. All in all, I would say it could have been, I felt it could have been funnier. I was expecting it to be quicker witted and when and when we were banging those scenes where he was talking to the publishers over the phone and trying to kind of lie about his kind of his background and his blackness and and, and a great moment i really like the scene actually where him and the movie producer were sat at the table and he, he hears a siren in the street and he's looking agitated but of course he's come along and he's talking like he's been in prison and the film producer is buying into it but but he runs away because he hears a siren and he's worried oh no because someone's looking after his mum who's got early stage alzheimer's or late stage alzheimer's and he's thinking oh my god that's a siren for her so when he runs but the film producer thinks he's running because actually he's always on the run because that's his thing that's his life so there's that wonderful line again in the trailer who says the dumber i get the more money the, the dumber i am the more money i make i just think that's really smart and i think that could speak to so many other aspects of of the creative industries i mean not in terms of women in terms of gay in terms of you know latin american in terms of you know any single minority group or any group that isn't male and white um you know this kind of there's a stereotypical permitted, and in fact, it's not just from white men, it's whatever the power group is of that time. So in this film, it's principally white men and white women. It's just an interesting film about how, with all the best of intentions, but are they the best of intentions? I mean, for me, even the last shot of this film suggests just a little bit that even within this fiction, this industry of fiction and storytelling and books and projects, and it, okay, a black man is now very successful, and Isaray is a black author that's really successful, but they're telling only one type of black story that these people, these gatekeepers will allow them to tell. If they're the gatekeepers, if these white publishers and white producers are still ultimately the gatekeepers, are we not still really engaging in a slave trade of sorts? And I think that's in there. Um, I, as I say, I wanted to be a bit funny. I wasn't entirely convinced by the bouncing back between uh, sort of creative, uh, you know, the story of his deceit and his and his kind of writing this satirical fiction versus his family. Some people feel they could have done with a bit more of the family. I, I think we've got enough of the family. I think it got a little bit twee at times. I think it sometimes got in the way. But I think for, for, for the fact that Sterling K. Brown is a sensational and searingly kind of pointed presence within this film, a really, a really complicated and acerbic character that really made me think a lot also about the black gay experience too. So all in all, I found this far more thought provoking and far more enjoyable than I was expecting it to be. Um, I, th I, felt it, I still felt it could have been a bit sharper and it could have like, but maybe it wouldn't have got made. Maybe for the very same reasons. If he got sharper and harsher, it would have got made. Anyway, what would I give it? I'd probably give this, I'd give it 79 out of 100.